So uh, one thing we like to do uh, at the IDE is to um, try to make it hard for ourselves uh, just to see what we can come up with. So uh, SEAL teams do this training called drown proofing. Anybody heard of this? Basically, they tie their hands and feet and they get into a pool and then they have to swim with their hands and feet bound. Uh, that's sort of like telling a digital manager to run their business without experiments. So that's exactly what we tried to do. Uh, in cases where you can run experiments, it's great. You can get uh, easy answers quickly. You can optimize the business. And even very small experiments, as we've seen from our conference on uh, digital experimentation that we have every year in the fall, you can get millions and millions of dollars in return from very small changes uh, that take into account consumer behavioral preferences and other things that may not be obvious. But the question we also want to ask ourselves is, what do we do when we can't experiment? Okay? So uh, I'd like to describe one project that we've done with a very large uh, global fitness tracking company uh, to answer a question that really can't be answered with an experiment. Uh, and that question is, is exercise contagious? In other words, if you're a user of a fitness tracking device, uh, this company wanted to know uh, if you exercise more, if we can convince you to be more active and to be more engaged with this product, will it create the same uh, behaviors in your friends, the people who you're connected to uh, and who may also use this, this product? And the reason they're interested in that is because any dollar they spend to change the behavior of a current user, if it spills over as a social multiplier to their friends, then this could potentially be a much larger increase in the ROI of any action. And you may want to target different people in your consumer population to maximize that value. Okay? The problem is you can't run around with a cattle prod and randomly you know, prod some people to run more and not others for a variety of reasons. Too costly, uh, wouldn't be practical, and so on. So what we wanted to do in this uh, study was to uh, use a robust measure of exercise uh, really focus on causal inference, but in a case where we can experiment, and then uh, focus on the generalizability of the results. So we worked with this large global fitness tracking company uh, and collected a whole bunch of data uh, to try and answer this question. And the real thing that we did was we spent about two and a half years trying to understand what could we do that would mimic an experiment but wouldn't be an experiment. Okay? And here's what we came up with. So we collected data on the global running activity of nearly 14 million people with over half a billion running events over five years, a very large data set of running activity globally. I think it's probably the largest data set of its type ever to be analyzed. This gives you a little sense of the diurnal patterns of uh, running over, uh, over time. You see people are much more interested in running on the weekends than on the weekdays. Uh, generally, people aren't running while they're sleeping, although some are, apparently. Um, and, uh, and, and you see sort of patterns that, that persist throughout the day. Um, and we also have a social network for this group of users who are, or, or runners who are uh, essentially connecting with each other on the platform and sharing their running activity data with one another. Think of these as sort of uh, running friends. So what we have in total for 15 million people is who runs, how they run, when, where, and how fast they run, and who their friends are for a global network of runners with uh, half a billion running events over five years. And what we're really interested in is what is going to be the substitute for the experiment. What is the, what is the cattle prod, or what is going to mimic the cattle prod in this case in a way that will be effective? Okay? So we thought and thought about this, and really what we need is we need some sort of variable or some sort of factor that is a random shock to some people's running behavior, but that is uncorrelated with their friend's running behavior. Does anybody have an idea or a suggestion of what might prompt someone to run that is not a cattle prod, not experimental, and is uncorrelated with the same uh, shock to their friends? Somebody has a heart attack, yes, that might be correlated with how healthy they are or how much they run. That might, it's not truly exogenous, not really outside of the individual's characteristics. The weather, excellent. I, all of you can join my team because it took us two and a half years to figure that out. Um, so we use the weather, okay? So here's a graph of running and precipitation in New York City over a year. Precipitation in blue, running in green. Every time you see a spike in rain, you see a subsequent drop in the running activity uh, in New York City. 
And it turns out this is not only true for New York, but true for all cities, and not only true for rain, but also true for te temperature. So people, this is per capita running in the major cities in the United States and precipitation. As it rains more, people run less. And it also turns out that we like to run only during good uh, temperature. So for instance, if it's too cold, we run less. If it's too hot, we run less. And in the sweet spot of, of a nice day, we're much more likely to run, okay? So we use the weather as sort of a substitute for an experimental treatment that will encourage some people to run, but not others. And we do this over geography. So we collected data from about 40,000 weather stations across about 40 countries for which we have running data. And this is the location of the 2,700 weather stations in the United States. Uh, they are uh, very well correlated with the density of the population uh, that we have as well. Uh, so we have good coverage of running uh, runners and what weather they experience. And essentially what we want to do in this case, which sort of gives you a little bit of uh, how creative you get when your hands and your feet are tied behind your back and, and you're thrown into a pool uh, and you don't have, you can't go to the experiment that you really want to run. Um, what we do is we essentially use exogenous variation in peers' uh, weather as an instrument or as a shock uh, to estimate uh, peer running activity, and then to see what kind of social effect that has on that person's friends. So we're sort of asking, does a rainy day in New York uh, reduce running in Arizona? Uh, because if it does, it's most likely through this social effect, that the runner in New York runs less, and his friend runs less because, uh, because of the social uh, peer effect. And when we do this type of analysis, we find very strong peer effects in running. So if you run an extra kilometer today, your friend, that will cause your friend to run an additional four-tenths of a kilometer today. Okay? And it's true for almost every uh, measure that we looked at. If you run faster today, your friends will, run, will cause your friends to run faster today as well. Uh, if you run a minute longer, it will cause your friends to run an additional 35 seconds than they would have. Uh, if you hadn't run uh, that amount. Um, and it decays over time. So two days later and so on, the, the effect is a little bit smaller. And we can also look at the heterogeneity of these effects over different types of people. So for instance, uh, couch potatoes and marathon runners, the archetypal running uh, types of people. Uh, I myself am a couch potato. I'm a retired uh, sort of semi-marathon runner. Um, so question to the audience, do you think couch potatoes will influence marathon runners more or will marathon runners influence couch potatoes more? And just to be clear, I'm saying if a marathon runner ran an additional mile, would it influence his couch potatoes to run more? Or if a couch potato ran an additional mile, would it influence his marathon running buddies to run more? What do you think? Couch potatoes more influential? Raise your hand. Okay. Marathon runners more influential, raise your hand. OK, raise your hand if you saw this presentation yesterday. <laughs> OK, so the answer is that couch potatoes are much more influential over their marathon running friends than vice versa, uh, which was a surprise to us. We would think that it would be the other way around. And in fact, these, uh, these estimates are very precisely estimated to be as close to zero as you can get when it comes to somebody who is so much more active than their friend. And we think this has something to do with the reference point. If I'm a very, uh, if I'm a runner who doesn't run that often, if my friend is a marathon runner, that's not a good role model for me. It's not a reference point that I would ach achieve or s aspire to achieve. So the relative distance in social space between two people moderates the amount of social influence in a sense, and that becomes very important. So uh, what about gender? What do you guys think is going on with regard to gender in this contagion? Is this contagion prevalent mostly amongst men, mostly amongst women, across genders? And if so, do men influence women or do women influence men? So uh, raise your hand if you think that women, that this is primarily happening amongst women. OK, amongst men. Across gender? OK, so you're basically right. Men. Uh, are, is where the contagion is the most prevalent. So as men run more, their male friends are more likely to run more. Uh, women don't influence women at all, apparently, in this uh, data set. So if, if a woman runs more, her female friends don't run more as a causal result of that. And there's an approximately equivalent uh, effect 
cross gender, whether it's men influencing men, uh, women or women influencing uh, men. So the point of this presentation is really to, to say, uh, we spent uh, uh, several years focusing on digital experimentation and how we can use experiments to promote digital strategy in the companies that we worked with. And we got a lot of really interesting uh, results and uh, big ROI sort of uh, learning uh, for those companies uh, through that kind of research. But frequently I had companies coming to me and saying, Sinan, we think the experimental work that you're doing at the IDE is great, but we can't experiment as easily as some of these other companies can. Or we don't know whether the ROI is there to set up a big experimental infrastructure, but we have a huge data exhaust where we collect tons of data about what consumers are doing, what their environment is like, what our environment is like. Can we use this data to substitute for the experiments? And the answer is yes. Thank you. Michael? I did hear your talk the other day, and but you still have a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually thought about it, and it led to a question in, in this regard. You're dealing with data exhaust, and you point out that there's an economic bar perceived economic barrier of entry. But you have, for example, with this example, uh, uh, weather. Have you thought about creating hybridizations of data exhaust and experiment, you know what weather forecasts are so that for certain subpopulations, for people who register, they're encouraged to do something that creates a different kind of signal within the regular activity anyway. So it's, it's rough experimentation. It's you know, only a certain portion of people will follow that. But can you leverage this data exhaust and, and do quasi-experiments that can provide interesting ways of adding value to what you're doing. Like, for example, doing it with people of certain age groups within that men versus women split. Yeah. So that sounds like a stratified random sample experiment. Uh, and yes, I think that's a, a great idea for a variety of reasons. Sometimes you're interested in a particular segment. Sometimes a particular segment is more prevalent in your consumer population. Um, but what I'm more interested in in this line of research is what you mentioned at the end, which is this notion of a quasi-experiment, where it's not really an experiment in the sense that the firm doesn't go through all of the motions of, uh, and it, 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 it requires a bit of rigor to do the experimental design right. It requires some uh, organizational commitment to do that. Uh, but this type of analysis is something that can be done without altering anything that the organization is doing using data that's publicly available and data that they're already collecting uh, to, to retrieve an answer that is nearly as reliable uh, as an experiment would be. And that's sort of the focus. But subpopulations, heterogeneity across groups, very important to us. How heterogeneous was the team, How heterogeneous was the team asking these questions? Was your team conducting this quasi-experiment? Uh, that team included myself and one other person. Uh, uh, he was a male, and he was, he's a, a, an electrical engineering PhD, now a postdoc at the IDE. His name is Christos Nicolades. Um, and there was a team on the other side uh, with the brand, and they had a diverse team of men and women uh, from different backgrounds that were focused on analytics uh, of various kinds. Okay. Well, thank you very much.